It's now my honour to introduce Professor Ken Smith, the Chief Executive Officer and Dean of the Australia and New Zealand School of Government. Ken is also Enterprise Professor at the University of Melbourne. And Ken joined ANZOG in May 2017 from London, where he was the Queensland Agent General and Trade and Investment Commissioner for Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa from mid-2011. Professor Smith brings extensive senior and diverse public sector experience from roles in New South Wales, Tasmania, and for almost three decades for the Queensland Government. He previously headed the Queensland Public Service as Director General of the Department of the Premier and Cabinet between 2007 and 2011, and held various department CEO positions in Queensland from the early 90s. Ken has worked on many national policy issues over the past three decades, particularly in housing and urban affairs, social welfare and education. Professor Smith has also served as Coordinator General and Director General of the Queensland Department of Infrastructure and has been the Director General of a range of large Queensland Government departments, including Education and the Arts, Employment and Training, Family Services, Disability Services Queensland and Housing, Local Government and Planning. He's been involved in Commonwealth state negoti negotiations from the early 80s onwards and has chaired many senior officer fora. Professor Smith has undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications in social work, majoring in social policy. He's worked extensively with and within the school, vocational and higher education sectors and is a fellow of the Australian College of Educators and Australian College of Educational Leadership. He has held adjunct professorial positions at the University of Queensland and the University of Sydney. Ken has extensive experience also as a chair and board member of several companies and state authorities in Australia and the United Kingdom, including, of course, as board member and chair of ANZOG. Please join with me in welcoming Ken to the stage. Uh, thanks so much, Sonia, and um, please bear with me. I was going to uh, read the speech today and because uh, there's a, a number of important issues I'd like to, uh, uh, to raise. Could I um, also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and their elders past, present and emerging? I also acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders and people present this morning. Um, I'll come back to you, David, uh, during the lecture, but it's great seeing uh, friends here, long-term friends, uh, Ian O'Connor and, uh, and Anna Reynolds, and uh, uh, a range of people I've worked with over a long period of time. And I won't uh, repeat those that uh, Rachel has introduced. I'd particularly like to thank Rachel, the Information Commissioner, for inviting me to deliver the Solomon Lecture to celebrate RTI Day this year. Since its beginning with a lecture from uh, Dr David Solomon in 2009, those sharing their wisdom have included a stellar group of senior academics, journalists and commentators. It's an honour to join their ranks. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the huge contribution, David, that you've made to public administration in Queensland and uh, nationally. Of course, I knew of David's work in heading EARC uh, post Fitzgerald, but I was working in uh, a line agency at the time in, in uh, the housing area and uh, didn't have the opportunity in the early 90s to work closely with David. Uh, but it was when I was DG of DPC and uh, uh, working with David in his adept leadership of the landmark review of Queensland's Freedom of Information laws as Integrity Commissioner uh, and in reviews of lobbying and uh, electoral funding initiated by then Premier Anna Bly that I saw firsthand the deep commitment David had to pursuing the public interest at all times and advocating for transparency as one of the major tools we have to drive better public administration and to keep all public officials elected or appointed duly accountable. My focus here today will be reflecting on my time as a bureaucrat in Queensland 
um, as Sonia has mentioned, um, uh, uh, since I left active service, which is a great thing because in reflection I can uh, 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 hopefully uh, say things that I wouldn't uh, as a, uh, a serving bureaucrat. Um, since then, uh, a again, uh, as Sonia mentioned, I, I spent a few years in London and then for the last 18 months uh, have been working as a pracademic, which is a really awful term, uh, for the Australia and New Zealand School of Government. But it is something that I think uh, is really important to get that mixture between practice and, and academia. And uh, Ian, I would uh, uh, be a great advocate of the need to, in fact, do that more, as we do in a range of professions, but not necessarily across, across public sector leadership and back into the academy. A major problem in government is obviously the relentless demand on our time from issue and crisis management. We all know about the 24-7 news cycle and that demands on public officials result in proper deliberation being sacrificed on the altar of expediency and short-term problem solving. In many ways, the problem for current governments is that they can't find the space to see the wood for the trees. I'm increasingly coming to the view that sabbaticals uh, should be a compulsory feature for those working in the public sector. I can hear you say yay. Um, as they are in the academy, there, there must be time to read, write, reflect and understand the bigger picture in which we should operate rather than being ground down by the relentless onslaught of, of somewhat administrivia from time to time. In the lecture today, I will focus on a range of issues we face as public officials, some very local, um, but some impacted by global trends. I want to firstly reflect on declining trust in governments that's been mentioned, and unfortunately, um, what's happening with uh, liberal democracies. Um, secondly, discuss the threat to transparency, as there is a global trend, I think, now towards uh, Siri's telling me, uh, Siri went up for me, uh, towards illiberalism and authorit uh, authoritarianism. Authoritarianism actually strengthens uh, globally, which is a concern. And thirdly, advocate the need to return to the basics of the fundamental purpose of ensuring public trust and the need to always operate in the public interest, as David has uh, continued to mention, rather than serve narrower sectional interests. I will contend that greater access to information and transparency will reverse some of these negative trends and create greater leg legitimacy by ensuring our representative democracies and their support institutions provide the space for deliberative and informed community engagement. In essence, this means open government achieved by working with the community rather than simply delivering what we as elites think is best for them. So if I could turn to the decline in trust and its con consequences. A decline in public trust and a rise of populism and alternative voices is the biggest background trend facing government. Sonia mentioned this. Global political events over the past few years have underlined serious and ongoing threats to the free flow of information and indeed to democracy itself. In this vein, I fear less the perils of fake news, but more importantly, a growing global aversion to evidence and an undermining of shared facts in political debate. We might broadly call this the retreat of truth. When a senior cabinet minister in the UK, in a populist outburst, says that the era of experts has had its day, we should begin to worry. Science, once revered as the search for truth, has for many the same status as belief systems, whether related to climate change, creationism, or indeed whether the earth is flat. Seriously, look at the growing group of people who are advocating that the earth is flat. There is growing view of the right to having one's beliefs treated equally as so-called scientific facts. The rise of populism is both a product of and a contributor to a growing loss of trust, not just in our politicians and established parties, but in the democratic institutions that support them. 
major international and Australian surveys map out warning sign after warning sign. I'd like to talk about a few of them to help establish the extent of the problem. The Pew Research Centre in the USA has documented public trust in institutions back to 1958. In the time of Eisenhower, Kennedy, and even the early years of LBJ's presidency, trust in government in Washington was high, well over 70 per cent, almost 80 per cent. Trust in political institutions and the political process were equally strong. It is astounding to see how sharply this has changed over 60 years to 2017. As partisan acrimony grows, overall faith in government and political leaders has fallen through the floor. Now, by the time of Trump, the percentage of the nation who trust in government in Washington is below 20 per cent, close to a 60 per cent drop in as many years. But the trend was clearly in place way before Trump became, came onto the scene. Decline is especially pronounced from one generation to the next, which is of great concern. So the World Value Survey documents changes in values in beliefs over time and allows for comparison between different birth cohorts or generations. Uh, however, their world spans the US and Europe. Uh, us Antipodeans didn't quite count in that survey. But I've got no doubt that it's the same here. A commitment to liberal democracy is far stronger amongst baby boomers than the following generations. Those cohorts following baby boomers possess a decreasing desire to live in a country that is governed democratically. Many commentators diagnose this as apathy, but the weight of learnt experience that creates such a consistent result should not be discounted. These younger generations have dwindling faith that democracy can deliver what they need and want. In an article in the Journal of Democracy, uh, Foa and Monk from Melbourne and Harvard universities respectively call this phenomena the democratic disconnect. My written speech will be available. It's a longer speech and we'll have more reference to these, uh, these uh, uh, references if you're interested in them. Now, Australia is not immune from the problem set out uh, in these international sur surveys either. Far from it. Indeed, uh, Professor AJ Brown from Griffith University, from the Centre of Governance and Public Policy, uh, have collaborated in the Australian Constitutional Value Survey, and it tells a similar s story. Decline is especially stark at a federal level in Australia. The ACVS uh, covers the years 2008 to 2017. During this time, trust in state and local government has stayed relatively stable in the mid-50s. You look at the, the trend lines are, are actually fairly good. Meanwhile, of real concern is trust in the federal government, this is a nine-year period, has um, plummeted from almost 82 per cent to now less than 50 per cent, 49 per cent in that, that period. And this is backed up by the Elderman Trust Barometer in 2018, which has seen Australia in the bottom third of countries surveyed. So we do have a problem. There are numerous troubling cases of misbehaviour and unethical conduct through to serious corruption in public office at a national level as well as at state and local government. Here in Queensland, as uh, uh, Sonia has mentioned uh, and Rachel mentioned, there have been several prominent cases, particularly in the local government sector, uh, and uh, yet arguments remain about transparency and right to information, as if it is counter to good public administration. This surprises me. The many examples close to home should underline the importance of systemic approaches to political accountability and integrity. Work that makes government more transparent or improves integrity must be seen as essential for rebuilding the trust that makes it possible for governments to operate effectively and work for the public good. I'm glad it's not mine, David. Um, I'm expecting David to intervene here and yell out, no, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. Um, if I could move to Fitzgerald um, uh, as being a defining point uh, in reform, one of the major reasons for the Solomon Lecture is to remind us of the dangers of ahistoricism. It is a plague of our age 
we see again and again that important lessons from our past are disregarded. The Fitzgerald inquiry is clearly a defining moment, not just in the history of this state, but of the nation. Integrity and trust in Queensland's public institutions was critically damaged by the shocking revelations of corruption in our core public institutions in the late 80s. However, as we all know, these issues weren't unique to Queensland. Fitzgerald took the opportunity to shine a light on events and relationships that may well have remained hidden if it wasn't for him and others in parliament, the media, police and honest public officials who had the courage and persistence to, tr to strive for transparency. Restoring these fundamental qualities is far harder than losing them. Restoring integrity and trust to an entire political system, to a number of public institutions and the public officers who are meant to uphold their integrity takes vision, leadership, commitment and courage. Tony Fitzgerald brought these attributes and more to the most challenging of tasks. He was faced with hardened corruption and criminal behaviour and unethical conduct on an institutional scale. I don't have time in this lecture to discuss the importance of in institutional integrity being a priori um, over attempts to monitor that of individual public officers. Suffice to say that Dr Nicholas Kirby from Blavatnik School at Oxford and more recently our own Simone Webb have done some interesting writing in this area which I hope will be released shortly. For now I'd like to reinforce Fitzgerald's point about the importance of a robust system to combat corruption and other unethical practices, a system which right to information legislation is an essential component. Fitzgerald's experience had taught him that selfish and corrupt are infinitely flexible in their ability to adapt um, uh, and work around new regulatory structures. And he warned, and I quote, individuals who work in institutions in need of reform must recognise that checks and balances and changes in attitudes are necessary if the activities of their less scrupulous colleagues are to be detected and controlled. Importantly, Fitzgerald understood nothing could be achieved without faith in the system itself. He argued, and I quote again, that the restoration of public confidence in the integrity of a vital element of public life is the paramount public interest to which other public interests must be accommodated. Fitzgerald considered deeply the importance of the public interest. The idea is arguably the central premise of the landmark report. The reforms which followed the bombshell, which was the Fitzgerald inquiry released on the 3rd of July 1989, were put in place by the Ahern, Cooper and Goss governments. The institutional framework of the CJC and, the, and EARC, uh, chaired initially by Tom Sherman, then Colin Hughes and then by uh, David Solomon, uh, were both established post Fitzgerald to ensure that the reform agendas recommended by the Fitzgerald inquiry were not lost once the final report was delivered. Most of the legislative reforms were put in place by the Goss government elected in late 1989, five months after the Fitzgerald report release. As Janet Ransley outlines, these two bodies accountable to parliamentary committees effectively took charge of a large part of the reform agenda of the parliament uh, in that 89 to 92 period. The significance of the report itself overwhelmed any policy ag agenda of those contesting the 1989 election, with policies recommended by Fitzgerald being given priority, often beyond the commitments that would have otherwise been developed by the parties themselves. Particularly in a unicameral system, establishment of two powerful independent bodies with a strong authorisation from Fitzgerald heavily impacted the parliamentary system in that, uh, that first term of the Goss government. Despite the perceived restrictions on parliamentary autonomy, the list of reforms implemented in that first term were impressive and provided the foundation upon which um, subsequent uh, laws like right to information uh, were placed. That included the introduction of initial FOI legislation, uh, judicial review legislation, 
the uh, legislative standards, whistleblower protection, introduction of pecuniary interest registers, uh, freedom of assembly, obviously administrative law requiring decisions to, uh, uh, to be clear. Amongst those, uh, I can remember some of the, the work on FLPs, fundamental legislative principles, uh, which were established at the time. Interestingly, the processes recommended by Fitzgerald impacted positively on the government's policy approaches in Queensland that were and have subsequently, I think, been characterised as, uh, and to quote Ransley, uh, centralist, closed and secretive in contrast to the public and consolidative me measures adopted by EARC and to a lesser extent by the CJC. So David Solomon has changed his spot very little over the last few decades. The reforms weren't without controversy. From the most senior members of Cabinet and within the reforming public service at the time, there, there were significant voices against the intent and cost of measures such as FOI, equal opportunity and judicial review. We sometimes forget uh, that uh, that occurred and uh, uh, Ransley in uh, a book edited by John Warner on the Goss government outlines the very senior members of Cabinet who were arguing publicly that these measures were too costly and uh, not effective. And, um, they were ba basically, Ransley said, uh, those reforms were promoted to government as being expensive, administratively difficult and likely lead to, what's most important for governments, potential embarrassment for government. I'll return to that. But how little things change, as I will refer to subsequently. If I could move on to the FOI review itself. I still clearly remember when Anna Bly became Premier in 2007. Literally her first act as a newly minted Premier was to announce the review of the FOI Act. Bly clearly wanted to put a distinct reform stamp on her administration given that uh, Peter Beattie had been in power for a long period of time. So being the, the first woman Premier, she was really keen to put her own stamp uh, on to the, the, the government. A as a new Director General of DPC, I was tasked with providing advice on the approach to the review uh, of the Act and uh, preparation of necessary Cabinet documentation. I've been through such exercises many times. I s I'm sure you can all anticipate the difficult task of getting the right expertise appointed to carry out complex tasks of government like the fundamental review of FOI legislation, which had changed dramatically, the environment had changed dramatically since the introduction of the original legislation by the Goss government in the immediate post Fitzgerald reforms of 1992. For example, we all forget uh, that uh, the internet actually didn't exist in 1992. Um, some uh, uh, who worked in the Office of Cabinet reminded me that there was an early experiment of uh, introducing emails and giving people email addresses. The only problem was you couldn't send emails because there was no one you knew the address to um, apart from the inner core in the, the, the Office of Cabinet, which is very, very different. I can remember first of getting email and every time you'd send an email you wouldn't trust it. You'd ring the person saying, I've just sent you an email, um, make sure you got it. Look, it was indicative of Bly's priority that the responsibility wasn't handballed at the time to the Attorney General uh, and his department. She wanted to personally drive this commitment through Cabinet and subsequently through the Parliament uh, to put her authority on the reforms and to assuage the doubters, um, which I can say were not only in her own party but in the government uh, generally for the need for fundamental reform. The appointment of the independent team has been mentioned of David Solomon uh, chairing Simone Webb and Dominic McGann was one of the easier appointment processes that I've been involved in in terms of recommendations. Their individual and collective expertise was never in dispute. The work proceeded r literally uh, at pace with a discussion paper released in January of 2008, the final report in June and the government's response in August of the same year. In 2009, Bly led the introduction of the ITI Act personally through the Queensland Parliament and it became law in July 2009. Um, responsibility for the legislation 
remained in premiers uh, and, uh, the, and D DPC for approximately 12 months before later transferring uh, to the attorney's portfolio. The bu bureaucracy is and should be relatively silent in its support, but I must recognise a few great efforts during the process, acknowledging there were many others. I'd particularly like to acknowledge Cathy O'Malley uh, in the background who supported David, the review team, Christine Carsley, uh, in DPC in leading law and justice. Um, I couldn't see Christine here, but uh, amazing uh, uh, work to get the legislation through the, um, through the, the, uh, the cabinet process, all of the, the difficult work on the authority uh, to uh, prepare, the authority to introduce, and the subsequent passage of the bill through the parliament. And the uh, information commissioner at the time, Julie Kinross, as, a, as all great public servants for their dedication, uh, professionalism and persistence in developing and delivering these landmark reforms, really, David, behind the scenes and behind the, the, um, the people that um, took, if you like, uh, obviously, uh, the public profile for the, the production of the reports. David and his co-authors sought not just to update freedom of information, but to fundamentally rethink the approach to uh, FOI in Queensland. Crucially, they set out a system for how governments should access the public interest on a case-by-case -case basis. The authors recognised the novelty of their logic, openly acknowledging in their introduction that, and I quote, the panel was invited by its terms of reference and comments by the Premier. Uh, to introduce recommendations that would look at best practice around Australia and the world. Whilst it has done that, in some respects, it has gone beyond best practice in the belief that it can produce a better, more effective model that in the public interest, and I'll return to that critical term, the public interest, will improve the delivery and availability of information held by government. The language, in fact, mirrors that of Fitzgerald almost two decades earlier. Fitzgerald spoke about the essential task of, and I quote, giving information to the community about what has occurred. On this point, Fitzgerald's report bears uh, quoting one more time. He sets out here a fundamental tension at the heart of FOI and RTI. He articulated that there is a need for a free flow of accurate information within a society. Such a flow of information is needed if public opinion is to be informed. Public opinion is the only means by which the powerful can be controlled. However, there is a conflicting right of individuals to privacy. In some circumstances, such privacy results in the secrecy which allows corruption to breed and official misconduct to escape detection. A culture of secrecy and a desire for non-disclosure are still commonplace across many areas of politics and the bureaucracy. It is vital that those who value a strong and effective liberal democracy advocate for transparency being firmly on the side of the public interest. Arguments remain about transparency and right to information as if it is counter to good public administration. Simplistic notions that FOI remains, uh, regimes are leading to a diminution of the public services capacity uh, to give the three Fs, free, frank and fearless advice, are in my opinion overstated. Public service advocates of this position, of whom there are many, posit that advice given by the public service could embarrass the minister or government if made public and therefore significantly affect the productiveness and trust relationship between the public service and the political class. Putting it perhaps oversimplistically, I would contend that this could happen for two broad reasons. Firstly, the public service advice is not based on evidence and is wrong or not nuanced to enable consideration of all workable solutions. Alternatively, the advice embarrasses the minister and the government because it doesn't align with its own world view or to meet its own sectional interests, irrespective of the evidence presented. In both cases, there is a strong case for transparency. There is an incentive in the former, 
to always provide the highest quality evidentiary advice, and in the latter to fully and explicitly explain a decision or position if an alternative decision is made to ensure it is legitimately and consistently in the public interest. Of course, one might hope today's threats to fair and ethical public administration are not so endemic, so entrenched, so egregious as they were in the days covered by the Fitzgerald inquiry. But we must remember the battle for transparency is not won through one inquiry or one piece of legislation. It is one that needs to be fought every day. I want to now move to comment on the importance of information transparency in the broader context of how governments decide what information they share with citizens. We can't have that discussion without recognising the huge changes in technology and the way we produce and share data. The material came through Pradeep Philp's advice um, to the Queensland uh, Government. More than half of the data developed by humanity, and this is frightening, has been produced since the start of 2017. That's just amazing. The challenge is that much of this data isn't of use. It doesn't have an evidentiary base. And yet, from a commercial perspective, data is seen as the new oil, the core of the business model of some of the most profitable global companies like Facebook and Google. Governments collect and store huge amounts of data, both through initiatives like the census, other survey work, and also as part of their routine activities of service delivery. So what do we do with that data? How do governments use it to create public value? With rapid changes in technology and information and data storage and use, these are essential questions for government and its accountability regimes, including the fourth estate. In Australia, as in any developed liberal democracy, the media is an important part of the checks and balances that keep the system accountable. The current fragmentation and concentration, ironically at the same time, of the media landscape, the collapse of uh, the traditional business model advertising support for mainstream private media companies and the relentless campaigns against public broadcasting, both internationally and here, should disturb anyone concerned about the quality of government and independent critique to ensure we can collectively speak truth to power. There is, however, some light on the horizon as new funding models are seeing a resurgence of quality mastheads and journalism. Attempts at nob nobbling public broadcasters have also met with significant resistance, particularly in the UK and here. Hopefully we will reach a tipping point where there will be reaction to journalists, or so-called journalists, who are more interested in being political players, you all know who I mean, and across every media form, than in independently pursuing the truth in, in support of broader rather than narrower sectional interests. If I can move to open data, data can also assist us in moving past uh, these narrow vested uh, interests. New York University academic and previous Obama administration advisor of open government, Professor Beth Novak, writes about the value of open data as a counterpoint and complement of FOI legislation. She says that in America, FOI tends to highlight the worst of government by demonstrating how public officials have uh, tried to hide misdeeds. It emphasises malfeasance, invari invariably shaping public perception of government. By contrast, the open data legal framework may be advancing participatory democracy. What does she mean by open data? Here are four examples of open data in action, two international and uh, two involving government and two with the private sector. In the USA, several states have begun collecting information about um, doctors' patterns of prescribing uh, opioid uh, pain medication in an effort to t tackle the pre prescription drug epidemic. This information is now made public by transparently showing doctors and their own practices in comparison to their peers. Um, in Arizona, a pilot program has seen uh, participating counties cut prescription rates by 10% and overdoses by 
In Oakland, a pilot program has given citizens with first aid skills access to real-time data and alerts on heart attacks or medical emergencies in their area so they can act as first respondents until paramedics arrive. Collaborative use of open data, of course, is not limited to government. During the Jakarta floods, Twitter donated its data to University of Wollongong, which used it to create a time map of flood conditions, allowing residents to develop their own escape plans. In the Ivory Coast and in Senegal, uh, Orange Telecom have uh, anonymised customer call data and handed it to researchers who use the data to predict how waterborne parasites and diseases travel. Uh, both are great examples of potential public-private data partnerships. Of course, private companies <coughs> are not going to hand over all their data because it is not in their commercial interests. But governments uh, acting in the public interest need to consider how they might regulate private companies accessing huge amounts of valuable private data which can be used for a valid public purpose. Governments similarly need to unleash the data sets they hold and link them to private data sets um, for the public interest. Uh, Beth Novak uh, says that uh, in the recent issues in Europe with the movement of refugees, um, it wasn't through those uh, um, forms that you fill out when you come into a country uh, that provided governments with uh, information about where the refugee movements were. It was access to data available from uh, handsets that, that people were carrying. So they knew uh, all the governments were aware of what was happening. And it, it's an example of a good public-private partnership. Um, but uh, we need to combine the innovation and flexibility of private data holders with the traditional emphasis on public value of the public sector. Technology has given us a new avenue to deliver major increases in public value. In, in Australia, we have been latecomers to open data, but this is changing. Uh, there's great reports by the Productivity Commission as well. Uh, Australia is seriously looking at um, open government. It's through its National Ac Action Plan. Um, the Chair of the Productivity Commission has spoken extensively in this area around big data. He says that not only had the federal government fallen behind the private sector in its use of data, it was being outrun by the states and uh, there's some uh, huge issues there. Um, ANZOG, as its name implies, also works across the ditch. New Zealand continues to rank the highest of all jurisdictions in the world in a range of measures on trust and transparency. In fact, it is number one out of 180 countries, according to Transparency International. Last week, and literally on the 18th of September, the New Zealand government announced that cabinet papers would be released after 30 business days, not 30 business years, or 20 business years, but after 30 business days. A few exemption around privacy issues uh, relating to individuals, including those getting titles, etc. But it really puts issues into perspective about their approach to open government and a belief in their community. Um, I think we need to shift some of our focus to, um, again, public benefit, public interest, but also the issue of problems in representative democracy that can effectively be dealt with by engaging citizens in truly uh, deliberative, deliberative, informed and engaging democracy. And it's one of the issues I think young people are interested in doing. They don't want to just elect people once every four years or once every three years. They want to be engaged and involved in decision-making processes uh, throughout that time. So obviously there's an issue of finding the balance um, between public value and public wealth. For any of you that have been involved in ANZOG, you'd be aware that um, uh, we almost preach on the issue of public value. And uh, some of the concepts were developed by Professor Mark Moore of Harvard Kennedy School, um, where in uh, the trilogy uh, he talks about the why of public purpose um, and then the how uh, of uh, public administration, the authorising environment and the um, organisational capability to deliver it. 
Governments create public value through policies and programs which deliver benefits to the entire community. Benefits which are consumed collectively rather than individual, individually. For those of you interested in this area, University uh, uh, College London uh, um, academic Professor Mariana Mazzucato has been doing some new and influential work to extend our definition of public value uh, to show how effective entrepreneurial action by governments can create public wealth. She defines public value as a process by which public wealth is created. Public wealth is regarded as a cumulative stock of the public value already created. Therefore, public investment in policy would create value and cumulatively create public wealth. This understanding moves beyond false and simplistic dichotomies of the innovative free market versus the meddling and inefficient regulatory state. It challenges the notion of economic orthodoxy uh, that value can only be created by the private sector and that the public sector is simply a consumption part of the economy and a barrier to economic growth and prosperity. If you want examples, think of uh, aviation technology, the internet itself, space travel, satellite technology, Wi-Fi, uh, aspects of all aspects of your iPhone, all aspects of your iPhone, um, which were developed in the, the public sector. Um, breakthroughs in pharma, green tech or nanotech, again, developed through the public sector. So there's a lot of talk about entrepreneurial private sector without a sufficient recognition of the role of the public sector in increasing public wealth, maybe not commercialised through the public sector, but often commercialised later through uh, the private sector. If I could come back to the crucial issue of public trust and public interest, I'd like to conclude by bringing the lecture back to the question of public trust and the fundamental importance of right to information in pursuing the public interest as the 2008 Solomon Report states, the public interest is the central unifying feature of freedom of information. In a speech delivered in 2014, David Solomon laid out the risk to public trust of nepotism and patronage in, in public office. David's speech stressed the paramount importance of the maintenance of public trust to a well-functioning and enduring democracy. There are two quotes in David's speech that have stayed with me. He quotes Professor Paul Finn, who elegu elegantly argued, the institutions of government, the offices and agencies of government exist for the people to serve the interests of the people and as such are accountable to the people. He also drew on former Australian High Court Chief Justice uh, Sir Gerard Brennan, who articulated a fundamental principle for the maintenance of public trust. And I quote from Sir Gerard, public interest is the paramount consideration in the exercise of all public powers. This is enshrined in our own Public Service Ethics Act, which states entities, agencies and public officials acknowledge the primacy of the public interest and undertake that any conflict of interest issue will be resolved or appropriately managed in favour of the public interest. Again, returning to Fitzgerald for inspiration in, and quoted from in that report, the outcome of the inquiry and report must be determined by the political process, as should be the case in a democracy. The public interest can easily be subordinated to other considerations and the consequences hidden or disguised in a defective political process. This is a um, fundamental and enduring theme from the time of Fitzgerald to today. Brett Walker, Senior Counsel, in the delivery of this year's Whitlam oration notes, the government has no private interests. It is an emanation of us, the governed people. This is why the RTI reforms and their implementation are so important to reversing the massive declines in trust we must do our utmost to ensure engaged, participatory and deliberative democracy. A willingness to listen and deliberate is not something that comes easily. It is easier if it is supported by information rather than simply opinion.
I particularly like the quote from Anthony King and Ivor Crewe's book on 30 years of missteps in the British government. They write that deliberation is not a word one hears very often in connection with British politics for the good reason that very little deliberation actually takes place. British politicians meet, discuss, debate, manoeuvre, read submissions, read the newspapers, make speeches, answer questions, visit their constituencies, chair meetings and frequently give interviews, but they seldom deliberate. King and crew are right. We often lack the ability to confer, to take counsel and then carefully weigh up options. We're busy doing and delivering, but often not spending enough time reflecting and deliberating. We might be producing a lot of widgets, but we need to have the cap capability to step back and see whether they are the right widgets for the time and place that, that we inhabit. Without the, the ability to talk more openly about our shared problems and to have those representing the public interest hear these conversations, we will not be able to solve them. So it is time for a change of approach focusing on transparency in the way we go about our business and continuing to open up government. And of course, access to the information which supports our evidentiary base for decision making. This will bring huge benefits to the community and importantly build rather than continue to erode trust in our democratic institutions. It is important to put the Queensland reforms in context and celebrate these great achievements whilst being vigilant to protect and enhance the RTI legislation and institutional framework, implement its intent and provide the institutional authority required to guard against complacency. Because as the US engineer and industrial pioneer W. Edwards Deming states, a bad system will beat a good person every time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. Can you please join me one more time in thanking Professor Smith? I'm sure Professor Smith's lecture will contribute to conversation, conversations well beyond today's lecture. Um, and as Professor Smith has made clear, uh, transparency requires persistence, resilience, and leadership to realise significant benefits to the community and to build trust in government. Uh, Professor Smith has kindly offered to take questions. We are running a little behind time, so we might limit that to one question, or if it's <laughs> two of the quick. Would anyone like to ask a question? It might be very quick. Queensland Ombudsman, yeah. Mr Clark. I agree. I agree. This is working. Um, I agree in, entirely with your comments, but I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on why, um, in, in public interest disclosure or, or whistleblowing uh, in the public sector, we still haven't managed to gain the confidence of whistleblowers uh, and their belief that they will be treated um, reasonably, fairly, and not discriminated against or disadvantaged when they blow the whistle. Yeah. Um, Look, thanks, Phil. I, I think the protection of whistleblowers uh, is really important. O obviously, if people are not involved in you know, vexatious complaints but, but real complaints, it, it requires dealing with those effectively and um, sensitively. Um, my sense is that there are some deeper issues here about public administration that I, I, I can actually um, see now from being on the outside and I'm really keen to comment on more. I think um, when, when uh, individuals, for example, when I use that, that, that issue about being free, frank and fearless, um, there are issues with the, uh, with the nature of the public service itself and the issues around, I think, uh, security of tenure 
and uh, I'm going to be controversial here. I think the issues, particularly with the senior executive and chief executive service, uh, I have some concerns with the ability to terminate without reason. I actually think it deals with a fundamental issue that um, if you're going to terminate contracts, there should be reason and there should, th there should uh, be consequences. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I think there are a range of issues that people look at public administration and wonder why, um, uh, the, uh, 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 why there are some concerns that, uh, that the, the political class aren't necessarily getting the right advice. Um, there's a paper uh, done by Anne Tiernan um, for the APS review which is fundamentally turning the issue back uh, to uh, the executive and political le leadership to basically say it's up to the parliament to redefine and understand the role of the public sector rather than simply the public sector to go through numerous conflicting reforms without you know, consistency. And I, sorry, that's probably getting outside of the whistleblowing issues, but I think that 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 is one of the, the the issues that people you know remain concerned about. That is, what impact will this have you know potentially on their career if they are involved in um, in whistleblowing activities? Any further questions? Uh, you're off the hook. Thank you very much. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, 2019 is the 10th anniversary of the legislation and an important part of these celebrations and to help improve practices across the sector is to share stories of your experience. Um, so we will be asking people both from the community and all Queensland government agencies to focus on this soon. We'll be calling, sending, as soon as we finish Right to Information Day this week, we'll shortly move on to next year. And uh, so that we can include your experience in our campaign for next year. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our, thank our event partner, Public Service Commission, and especially Ms Sonia Cooper. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our staff who organised the event today, Vivian Vanderlark. Uh, Stephen Haig and Anna Compton and in particular I'd like to thank Professor Smith for joining us from ANZOG, our 2018 Solomon Lecturer and um, I'd like to invite you to join us for a light lunch directly outside in the foyer so that you can discuss the lecture further and um, thank you all for your attendance here today both in person and via live stream. Um, I encourage you all to reflect on Professor Smith's lecture and what you can do to improve access um, and build trust through transparency for this Right to Information Day and throughout the coming year. Thank you very much.